the Socratic Club. Um, as of now, we just have this one mic, so just let, let me know if I'm a little too quiet. Uh, we're just going to pass this around at this point. Um, so I'll get started and then we'll get to our speakers. So the Socratic Club organizes religious debates between scholars for the benefit of OSU and the surrounding community. The club was founded in 1941 at Oxford University with C.S. Lewis as its first president. The mission of the Socratic Club is to provide, to provide an open forum for the, the discussion of intellectual difficulties connected with religion and with Christianity in particular. Also, this year is the Socratic Club's 10th anniversary at OSU, which is a major milestone uh, for everybody involved. Uh, more information on the club and essays by C.S. Lewis can be picked up for free out front in the lobby as you guys leave. Um, hopefully some of you got some as you came in as well. And our website is a great source for information, and there's a link for the website on the brochures uh, in the lobby. And we also have a brand new YouTube channel with a lot of our debates um, posted up there in video format, so you can watch our debates online. And the link for the YouTube channel will be on the website if you go to the videos tab. Let's see, so, our, so tonight's topic is Will the World End Soon? Apocalyptic Visions of the Future and we'll feature our four speakers in a panel discussion format. Each speaker will be given 10 minutes to speak on the topic. This will be followed by 20 minutes of discussion, during which the speakers may ask questions of one another. Next questions will be taken from the audience from all of you for 45 minutes. And we will allow questions to individual speakers or multiple speakers, so be thinking of your questions as you listen tonight. And possibly write them down so you have them prepared. Uh, we will close a little after 9 o'clock with a two-minute closing, closing statement from each speaker, and then we'll be done for the night. So, tonight's first speaker will be Dr. Gary Ferngren. Dr. Ferngren has been teaching Greek and Roman history here at Oregon State University since 1970, and he teaches regularly in the University Honors College. He completed his undergraduate studies at Western Washington University, and then went on to receive his MA and PhD degrees from the University of British Columbia. His research interests include the social history of ancient medicine, religion in ancient medicine, and the historical relationship of science and religion. Dr. Ferngren has edited three major publications in these subject areas and is currently writing a book on medicine and healthcare in early Christianity. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gary Ferngren. speakers tonight presents his or her, or her own perspective on some particular apocalyptic scenario. And by apocalyptic, I mean a view that the end of the world is coming soon, next week if not tomorrow, according to some people. My apocalyptic event is the return of Jesus Christ, and as will, as will become evident, I speak from a Christian perspective. More than a year ago, Harold Camping predicted that Jesus Christ would return to Earth on May 21, 2011. His return to judge the world would reward the righteous and punish the wicked. And his return would result in cataclysmic events that would take place throughout the world and throughout the universe. Now, Camping was a well-known radio preacher. He founded a radio station that has since become uh, a major network. And he had twice before predicted Jesus' return, once in 1988 and then again in 1994. In both cases, he was mistaken. But in the last few years, his preaching became especially... Christ on a particular date. 
If you look at I'm not sure I might have to If you live in or near Corvallis, you might have seen the billboards that appeared on Highway 99. One coming into Corvallis and from the north and one from the south announcing the end of the world. Now, it wasn't just um, strange types of people who accepted this. Many people, thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands, were convinced by Harold Camping that the world was going to come to an end on Christ's return. The problem was that May 21 came and passed, and the world was still here. So Harold Camping went back to his data, did some um, recalculations, and announced that he'd been wrong. Jesus was coming back on October 21 of this year. And in case you haven't counted, that's four years, four days that you have left. <laughs> now, Harold Camping is just one of a number of apocalyptic visionaries who studied the Bible to try to determine when Jesus will return and when the end of history will come. This isn't the first time that's happened. It's happened a number of times. I suppose the most famous was a man named William Miller, who in 1836, who was a self-trained preacher, uh, became convinced from his study of the Bible that Jesus was going to return um, in 1836. Actually, he made the uh, prediction in 1831. Uh, no, I'm sorry, let me get my dates wrong. He made it in, in uh, 1936. He said Jesus was coming back in 1841. When the event didn't happen, he uh, went back to his drawing board and reset the date for 1844. And uh, the scenario is very famous. People sold their goods, they dressed in white robes, some people got up on the roofs of their houses to wait the second advent. And of course, large numbers of people were disappointed. And since then, I'm guessing that at least once a year, somebody someplace in the world predicts the return of Jesus Christ. And the person becomes a nine days wonder, and then joins that group of people who we might call false prophets. <coughs> Over a hundred years ago, somebody in London told the celebrated preacher Charles Spurgeon that he had computed the exact date of Christ's return. And Spurgeon said, that's interesting. He said, do you know that of all the people who have predicted that event before, the failure rate is... 100%. And Spurgeon asked, what makes you think you're any different? Let me explain just briefly why it is that people make this kind of apocalyptic prediction. The New Testament, the Gospels in particular, indicate that before Jesus ascended into heaven, he predicted his return to the earth at the end of time. Um, and there are a number of books in the Bible that have apocalyptic themes. The two most famous apocalyptic books are Daniel in the Old Testament and Revelation in the New Testament. There's also a very lengthy discourse by Jesus in Matthew 24. It's called the Olivet Discourse. But it's in the apocalyptic books, more than in the narrative passages, that people look for end time scenarios. Daniel and Revelation especially. They're both apocalyptic books. They're highly symbolic. Um, the visions include um, um, ethereal uh, descriptions, esoteric animals, symbolic numerals, and the like. They're difficult to read, both books. Open the book of Revelation anywhere and see how much understanding you get on the first read. Very difficult book to read, even more difficult to interpret, understand. And that's why prophets like, self-proclaimed prophets like Harold Camping, go to those two books. They uh, are full of symbolism out of which one can squeeze different meanings. And Camping would take chronological hints or symbolic numbers and squeeze a particular meaning out of them and come up with what appeared to be a plausible scenario of the future. Um, now, if you read either of those two apocalyptic books, the general meaning is fairly clear. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to understand, we'll say, the broad sweep of, of the books. But if you go into detail and try to build schemes that include precise dates and times and events, 
you have to make certain assumptions. And sometimes those assumptions are highly questionable. Distinguished scholars from all points of view have studied Revelation for several hundred years. And there is a diversity of interpretations. I have read many of the different interpretations. Some of them are more plausible than others. But the fact that the greatest biblical scholars of all time have disagreed, sometimes pretty markedly, over certain passages in Revelation or Daniel, suggests that maybe we should take a cautionary point of view toward any particular point of view. And that's why Charles Spurgeon, quoting a game, said, only fools or madmen are positive in their interpretation of the apocalypse, the apocalypse being the book of Revelation. Fools and madmen. And he didn't mean that everybody who studies the book and tries to interpret it is a fool. He meant the person who says, I've got the answers. Now, I've studied the book of Revelation in some detail for quite a few years, trying to squeeze the meaning that I could out of it. And I have to say, over my lifetime, my views have changed several times over the meaning, even the rules of hermeneutics that one uses to interpret the book. And if someone like Harold Camping claims absolute authority, even infallibility, for an interpretation of the book, I lose uh, trust in anything else the man has to say, particularly if he takes some of the most controversial chapters in the entire Bible, let's say Genesis 1 or Revelation 20, and uh, says, I have the answer. I think in difficult cases, you have to allow some leeway for different points of view. And this brings me to my last point. Are we living in the last days? Does Bible prophecy allow us to say, yes, we can look at the events, the wonders in the skies, and the heavens, and say we're in the last times? I think the answer is no. And the reason is that um, if you look at, let's say, the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, where Jesus was talking to his disciples, um, he specifically refused to set a time for an event. Jesus' disciples came to him when he was seated on the Mount of Olives and showed him Herod's magnificent temple. And Jesus said, that temple will be destroyed so that not one stone is on top of another. Well, they were, they were simply um, flabbergasted by what he said. And Jesus then went on to say, Throughout history, a variety of things will happen that seem apocalyptic. Floods, earthquakes, and the like. None of these constitutes a reason to expect the last time or the last event. These things are things that will happen in history, but you cannot know the times and the seasons. And if that's the case, if the times and seasons cannot be calculated, then it seems to me that we have to be content to say, and I speak here as a Christian, if Jesus comes back at the end of time, um, it's something that is unpredictable so far as a pattern can be set. Christians believe it's an event that will happen. Uh, so far as any people who have a particular scenario, a particular schema, I'm um, very skeptical about that. Prophecy in the Bible tends to have an ethical value. That is, the purpose is to make people lead more godly lives, not to make them look at their clocks or their calendars to see if they're living in the last time. And biblical prophecy doesn't have that effect to make people who claim to serve Jesus into better people who desire to live for him. It seems to me it doesn't do much good and it might do a good deal of harm. Tonight will be Dr. Nicole von Germitten. Uh, she's an associate professor of Latin American history here at OSU. Uh, she received her PhD from the University of California at Berkeley in 2003 and also holds an MA in Spanish language literature. Dr. von Germitten has written two books and has contributed to several edited volumes and journals, including Black Mexico Studies in 18th Century Culture, uh, Colonial 
Latin American Historical Review, and Local Religion in Colonial Mexico. She was also affiliated with the Stanford University Center for Latin American Studies in 2008 and 2009. Please welcome Dr. Nicole Longer.
there's really no evidence that the long count, this 5,100 years, was important um, after 1000 AD. So uh, five or so centuries went by uh, between the importance of this and the coming of the Spanish when it was kind of a forgotten um, aspect of their uh, calendar. And, but what continued to be as important is their calendars of 365 days based on the sun and 260 days based on the lunar cycle. Now, you've probably heard of some other much more famous sites like Palenque, where um, there are dates inscribed in this city of Palenque in Mexico um, that show that the Mayas conceived of time outside and beyond the long count. So there's individuals who are presented in the inscriptions in Palenque that lived through the beginning of the, uh, this particular long count, right? So they were alive before, they were alive after, they didn't suffer any apocalypse at that moment. Um, the Maya also do not emphasize a period of destruction at the beginning or end of this cycle. So the, end, the beginning and the end of the long count is simply a time where you would say, uh, symbolically, you turn over the page of your calendar. That's it, right? It's not uh, end of the universe, it's resetting of the clock. So this one particular monument is the only known archaeological trace of ancient Mayas uh, stressing this particular date. Another famous city, Copan, um, emphasizes other years, like the year 90000, as an important moment. And that passed uh, uh, about 1,500 years ago with no problem, right? Um, no harm was done, right? Uh, some scholars believe that this monument in El Guerrero is uh, misinterpreted because maybe they just wanted to emphasize that, that they were a great civilization and they'd be around until the end of time. Uh, for example, a way that you might say this particular monument will stand in 2000, you know, if it was built in 1900, right? So, um, saying this city's going to stand for a century. No, no proof that it's a prophecy of disaster, maybe more of a bragging. Now, the other point that I'm going to make here is that um, the contrast to all these ideas from the Mayas is um, more connected to uh, uh, two of the, our other speakers um, that we've just heard and we'll hear at the end of this presentation. The people who were really concerned with the apocalypse were the Spanish, who came uh, with an evangelical mission to the Americas, um, most importantly led by Franciscan friars that settled in central Mexico. And they were deeply influenced by uh, medieval European millenarian ideas. They sincerely believed in the imminent return of Christ and felt that one of the final hurdles for this would be teaching the gospel to and baptizing the indigenous peoples of the Americas. So around 1500, they were at a peak in apocalypticism in Spain, and so when they encountered um, people in central Mexico in 1519, they really uh, expanded this. Um, so for this reason, they staged mass baptisms from the 1520s and missions throughout what's now Mexico and all Latin America. So in essence, this mission project was the final flowering and explosion of medieval apocalyptical mysticism. <clears throat> Um, Mayas and other indigenous people were educated in Franciscan missions and Dominican missions, and they absorbed uh, European millenarian ideas from the 1520s onward. Uh, we don't really, we have very few uh, codices or written documents of any kind from before the conquest. Almost every piece of written information we have about the Mayas, um, you know, paper as opposed to stone, comes from the colonial period, and so anything written in the colonial period is going to have an influence of Spanish Christianity. Any written literature will have an influence of Spanish Christianity, uh, even the most traditional appearing sources. So scholars who read and speak um, Maya, who dedicate their lives to researching ancient, colonial, and modern Maya, do not notice that uh, the end of the world is a serious aspect of their worldview, a concern of their culture. Uh, you don't see this as an emphasis in their architecture, inscriptions, religion, or daily conversation, which you could contrast with medieval Europe where you see uh, Judgment Day images all over the place, including in um, Latin America. The, the focus that uh, people who, who know about the Maya uh, notice is concerns about fertility, the agricultural cycle, local identity, and permanence of where they, they live, the measuring of time through astronomy, uh, and more positive things like beauty, laughter, humor, um, some of the fundamental, fundamental um, sorry, characteristics uh, that emerge when we study Maya culture throughout the centuries. Um, a lot of confusion comes because people tend to um, intertwine the Aztecs with the Maya, and these are both uh, different, uh, not connected chronologically, not connected geographically, and not connected uh, culturally. Right? Um, 
But the Aztecs also had ends and beginnings to their calendrical cycle, and these were also celebrated with demonstrations of renewal, like a well-known um, ceremony called the New Fire Ceremony. Rebirth, uh, renewal, not destruction. And in fact, a lot of times when you see representations of the Maya um, predictions of the apocalypse, you will see the Aztec calendar stone as the visual image um, connected with Maya predictions. So, Muddling up these civilizations and their symbols and their histories actually prevents us from understanding what the Maya were actually trying to say and learning from them. So in conclusion, uh, Western, not Maya, Maya civilization, is concerned with the apocalypse. I believe it's a completely modern phenomenon to attribute this kind of predictive power to uh, any given uh, group of indigenous peoples. And I think it, it, instead of being a positive attribute, it, it sort of makes them seem more exotic and different from us, which actually does nothing to help their current situation concerns such as immigration, sustenance for their families, really more far more relevant than kind of exoticizing them um, <clears throat> and, and associating them with fantasies about the end of time. Um, so you can go to uh, the Yucatan and get a, on, um, I guess it would be December 16th, and get a four-day package, the fifth day free, if you last to the 22nd, I guess. <laughs> so go ahead and do that, you know. Although the money that you give to that um, tourist resort is not going to benefit the local Maya very much, I guarantee it. So um, for all these reasons that I've said, um, like really I think the comments of my fellow pa panelists are more relevant to explain the current fascination of the apocalypse than any uh, dreams we might have about the Maya predictions. Thanks. third speaker will be Dr. Alan Thompson. Uh, he is an assistant professor of philosophy here at OSU, and he earned his MA and PhD degrees from the University of Washington in Seattle. Dr. Thompson comes to OSU from the Department of Philosophy and Religion at Clemson Uni University, where he also worked with the Restoration Institute, uh, the Rutland Institute for Ethics, and the doctoral program in planning, design, and the built environment. His primary areas of interest are environmental philosophy, philosophical ethics, social and political philosophy, and practical reason. Please help me welcome Dr. Alan Thompson. Thank you. Give me the thumbs up. Okay. All right. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Ferguson and Matt and the other uh, organizing members of the Socratic Club for hosting this event tonight. Maybe you'll give me just a moment to thank them all. Well, I appreciate being here. Um, first, I want to say that I am a, a philosopher and I do ethics. I don't do climate science, but I do environmental ethics, and the climate crisis has really swamped the field of environmental ethics, and so I want to uh, address this a little bit. I share Dr. Ferguson's ambivalence about uh, prediction, speaking to or considering ourselves too long and deeply with predictions about the apocalypse, because as we all know, the, the end is always near, um, but it doesn't quite come around the corner. It turns out that my job is to uh, attend to this uh, from the best of our atmospheric and climatic sciences. The little lead-in to uh, the discussion here tonight, for me, connected Al Gore's predictions, uh, scientists and Al Gore, with in, in the possibility of environmental disaster within the next generation. I'd like to say first that um, the people on the Maldives island, the Maldives islands, this generation are facing a climatic disaster as their island is going underwater. People in Australia have had two hundred year floods, right, occurring at a regularity, a severity of 100, once a hundred years in the last couple of years. So it's unfolding now. We're in the middle of an unfolding climate crisis, and I want to try to return to that, contrast it with the idea of apocalypse in just a couple of minutes. But Al Gore won the um, Nobel Peace Prize, as you know, in 2007 for his work on uh, making available to the public ideas about global climate change, but he co-won that award with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is a board commissioned by the United Nations and tasked with reviewing and assessing the most recent scientific, technical, and socioeconomic information produced worldwide relevant to understanding climate change. 
They provide us with a clear scientific view on the risk of climate change. And so in the first part here, in five minutes, I want to talk a little bit about revealing much of the material that you should know already, the science of climate change. And then in the latter half, I want to talk a little bit about visions of the apocalypse or apocalyptic visions connected with this. <clears throat> so the Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, was established in 1988. <clears throat> and uh, their fourth assessment report, which come out roughly every, every five, five plus years, came out in 2007. 30 countries were represented with more than 2,500 expert scientific uh, reviewers. There were a large number of government reviewers. There were more than 800 contributing authors and more than 450 lead authors. This is the global authoritative document for uh, the conditions of global climate change, the best of our world science. The IPC does not carry out any scientific investigation themselves. They merely compile and filter and present the findings at behest of the UN to the world. There were some criticisms of this. There are ongoing criticisms, of course, like in any good scientific enterprise. In particular, Michael Mann's hockey stick graph, which shows uh, temperature going up at the very end, like a, like a hockey stick. Uh, but a National Academy of Science inquiry requested by the United States Congress agreed that there were some statistical failings, as uh, Professor Mann had noted, but that these had little effect on the graph, which was generally correct. It's also widely believed that uh, the IPCC reports have very conservative nature due to the presence of the governmental uh, agents on the board who will, won't let a very inflammatory or sort of um, more provocative findings rise to the top. There's, there's some worries that uh, the whole thing sinks to the lowest common denominator. Let me say something about uh, some of their findings in 2007. Global warming is unequivocal, and so far we've experienced a 0.8 degree Celsius rise from the historic pre-industrial norm. Greater than 90% probability of human responsibility for most of the observed climate change. 11 of the past 12 years have ranked among the 12 hottest years on record. Uh, we're, we're facing and continue to see increasingly severe weather. This includes more severe tropical storms, uh, greater precipitation, that is deluges, which we've seen both in summer and in winter, uh, and record drought, which we continue to see. Uh, there'll be uh, melting and thawing. Uh, so 7% of the seasonally, we, we've had a loss of 7% of the seasonally frozen ground. So that is all of the ground that freezes each year is 7% less. Doesn't sound like much, but that's just sort of so far. Uh, glaciers and snow cover are declining worldwide, and the Arctic uh, sea ice is, has declined more than 20%. The Arctic summer sea ice has declined more than 20%. I want to return to that. And of course, there are rising uh, sea levels around the world. <clears throat> the predictions into the future about global climate change uh, for the latter half of the century, particularly, depend upon different emission scenarios. And so the IPCC considers a number of emission scenarios, ranging from very early and rapid responses from countries, ranging to business as usual, or sort of the worst no, no response on our behalf. So the range I want to talk about now falls between our being very active uh, early and rapidly, starting in 2010, which is now passed, with a 3% decline per year in our CO2 emissions. Okay, a 3% decline would be rapid. It's predicted by the end of the century we would be at 2.1 to 2.8 degrees Celsius greater than the historic uh, norm. And we're at, uh, turns out we're at 1.4, we're locked into 1.4 now. I, mean, I, I uh, forgot to mention we're at 0.8 higher now, but another 0.6 is locked in even if we were to cease all emissions today because of the heat retained by the ocean and because of the nature of CO2's lingering uh, presence in the atmosphere. If we stop by 2010 at a 1% decline, we're looking at 2.9 to 3.8 degrees Celsius increase by uh, 2100. If we're late and slow, that is by 2030, we have a 1% decrease, we're looking at uh, 4 to 5.2 degrees increase in Celsius by the end of the century. And finally, if we continue with business as usual, we're looking at 5.5 to 7.1 degrees Celsius increase by the year 2100. Now, there was widespread agreement at the UN in the Cancun Agreement that uh, in the second article, what is known as dangerous anthropogenic interference with the global climate system, which the body is instituted to, uh, to avoid, stands at an increase of 2 degrees Celsius. That 2 degrees Celsius counts as dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. Not one of the predictive models that exist today 
as is coming in lower than two degrees Celsius. Okay? Not one of the scientific models. <clears throat> We're committed, as I said, to at least 1.4 today. So, uh, on divisions of the apocalypse. Let me read this definition of the apocalypse first. Number one, the complete final destruction of the world. Number two, an event ev involving destruction or damage on an awesome or catastrophic scale. Now, I don't think climate change is going to be an, uh, an apocalyptic event in that sense. It's not like coming to the edge of a cliff and falling off. It will not be in the human time scale an event which happens within a day or a week or a month or a year or even a decade or even a couple of decades. Right? We're talking about really an unfolding climate catastrophe. And the question before us is, how much are we going to try to save? How much are we going to try to save of the conditions on the planet as we have all come uh, into it in our maturity and come to know and love it? Let me read you some descriptions then in increasing order from a variety of authors that cast, though, a kind of apocalyptic vision of the future. Uh, first here we have just predictions of, a, of loss of water supplies. So what does a, a greater than 2 degrees Celsius increase in the norm um, involve the loss of water supplies to hundreds of millions of people, largely in Southeast Asia, as uh, the glaciers on the, uh, the, um, the Himalayas go away. Okay? All the fresh water going into Asia. Uh, loss of coral reefs, rainforest, and other significant global assets. Loss of 50% or more of all species, that is, uh, uh, plants and animals. 50% or greater loss of all species, of all plants and animals. Uh, increasing crop failures at low latitudes, an inundation of coastal areas, and a rapidly rising death toll from disease, flooding, and heat waves. We will see climate refugees uh, growing at a rate, it's been recently predicted, of uh, 5 to 10 million, excuse me, it's 1 million per year, and so we're looking at at least 5 million within the, within the next decade, of climate refugees moving then out of the inundated uh, low-lying areas into other places, and you can imagine the sort of civil strife with people who have theirs and are more protected and don't like the, on, the oncoming of all these other people. Uh, the IPCC climate models. One minute, okay. Um, so <laughs> I missed the five in that one. Um, so let me just give you some of these quotes. James Hansen, the number one climate scientist in the U.S., says, If humanity wishes to preserve a planet similar to that on which civilization developed and to which life on Earth is adapted, Paleoclimatic evidence uh, and ongoing climate change suggest that a CO2 that CO2 will need to be reduced from its current updated to 389 parts per million to at most 350 parts per million. If the present overshoot of this target of CO2 is not brief, there's a possibility of seeding irreversible catastrophic effects. I just want two more quotes. Based on um, this is from the World Resources Institute recent release of climate science 2009 to 2010. Based on physiological estimates, the global average temperature increase of 7 degrees Celsius, which is toward the extreme upper part of the range of current predictions, would make large portions of the world uninhabitable to human beings. And finally, James Lovelock, the, uh, the, the coiner of the idea of uh, the Gaia hypothesis, writes recently in a book, Revenge of Gaia, without realizing it, we've poisoned the earth and our emissions of greenhouse gases and weakened it by taking for farmland and housing, the land that once was home to, of ecosystems that sustained the environment. We've driven the earth to a crisis state from which it may never, on a human time scale, return to the lush and comfortable world we love and in which we grew up. So is our civilization doomed? And will this century mark the end uh, with a massive decline in population, leaving an impoverished few survivors in a torrid society ruled by warlords on a hostile and disabled planet? I encourage you to consult the best available science or the legitimate authorities and to draw your own conclusions. What we do now will make all the difference. Thank you. <laughs> all right, thank you, Dr. Thompson. So our last speaker, will be the Reverend Martin Emmerich. He's currently the pastor of Westminster, Westminster uh, Presbyterian Church here in Corvallis. A native of Germany, he holds a BA in law from the University of Frankfurt. Dr. Emmerich also holds a Master of Divinity degree from Westminster Seminary in Escondido, California, and a PhD in Biblical Hermeneutics from Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia. 
is the author of Pneumatological Concepts in the Epistle to the Hebrews and several articles. Please welcome our fourth and final speaker, Dr. Mark Mendez. struggle that I've faced in speaking after three previous speakers and uh, still wishing to gain your attention and uh, still I left my clown's costume at home. <laughs> the 19th century New York farmer and Baptist preacher William Miller earned admission into our history books by predicting the end of the world. The 2,300-day prophecy of Daniel 8.14 was interpreted using an, uh, an apocalyptic grid by which the 2,300 days were converted into years of the same number. <coughs> the decree of the Persian emperor, Artaxerxes I, to rebuild Jerusalem in 457 BC, Miller, for reasons that we cannot analyze now, believed to be the beginning of his time path that would then end at the end of these 2,300 years somewhere between March 21st, 1843 and March 21st of the next or the following year, 1844. You can imagine the look on Mr. Miller's face when after poring over his notes and looking up he came to this conclusion, but to make a long wait, a year-long wait short, the prediction failed. Mr. Miller was not discouraged, but after consulting with friends, he then set a new date to April the 18th, 1844. It also failed. Yet again, Mr. Miller continued. Uh, he now, relying on the uh, calendar of Karaism, that is the ancient Jewish biblical calendar based or uh, anchored in Torah, he now predicted that the end of the world would occur on October the 22nd, 1844. October the 22nd came to be known as the Great Disappointment. The 22nd turned into the 23rd and the unthinkable happened. The sun rose upon that day. <laughs> the 23rd turned into the 24th of October, and October into November, and 1844 into 1845. And five years later, Mr. Miller perished. As Mary, as, uh, excuse me, as Gary mentioned earlier, a group of 200 people dressed in white robes, agreed to meet in a certain place to await the coming of the bridegroom. They spent their time waiting there, and after October the 22nd, disappointment and disillusionment swept through the ranks of the Millerites. Harold Camping, a name that many of you may have heard, um, how many of you have? Besides from Gary, many of you have knowledge of Mr. Camping. Mr. Camping actually sets, uh, has set as many as a half a dozen of dates of the return of Jesus Christ between 1994 and October 21st of this year, in fact, this very week. Camping has much in common with Mr. Miller. Camping has divined the precise timing of Christ's return on several occasions. He has had the privilege of being confounded on several occasions and still lives with the idea of being able to pinpoint the precise return of Jesus Christ. Like Miller, he may well take his hobby to the graveyard. But this brings me to the core of my assignment. I'm supposed to answer the question, and I can only answer this question theologically because that is what I can contribute to this discussion. Why in all the world do Christians so strongly insist on predicting the return of Christ? 
What is it that resonates so strongly with the human spirit that we, time and again, play with the crystal ball and come up with chronological schemes that afford the luxury of marking your calendar for the end of the world? A dubious luxury it is, indeed. <laughs> I believe our fascination, quite simply, can be explained by the fact that we do not do very well in taking no for an answer. <laughs> so let me briefly talk about knowledge and in particular the limitations and the idolatry of human knowledge. Human knowledge is good. Human knowledge is necessary. Human knowledge is real. Human knowledge is power and control. Human knowledge is in some ways even profound, but it will always be defined <coughs> by its creatureliness and thus by its limitations. The boundaries of what is knowable are not the result of clever negotiations on our part, but they have been set by the all-knowing maker of all things. And one of the limits imposed upon the creature concerns the future. Yes, this world answers to study and investigation. And please, study and investigate the world. Find out more about it. And yes, many of our plans for the future are on target and succeed. Because the world is the way that it is, in many ways very predictable. I can study meteorological patterns and calculate with a fairly high degree of probability. Meteorologists say uh, on average around 80 to 85 percent that tomorrow or the day after tomorrow it will rain. <laughs> no, in this part of the world you can often dispense with meteorological credentials and come to the same conclusion. Be that as it may, absolute certainty, absolute certainty eludes us. There are no guarantees. And that is because knowledge, knowledge not projection, calculation, However well it may be grounded in a model or a system of research, knowledge of the future is a divine prerogative. Who knows the person's thoughts except the spirit of the person that is in him? So also no one knows the thoughts of God but the spirit of God. The Beatles used to sing, tomorrow never knows. God knows. God knows. Now in his word, he has given us certain clues about timing, certain clues about the end of the world. Things I do not have time to dwell on tonight. But again, even this revealed knowledge of God is limited. The outer limit of this revealed knowledge about the end comes in the words of Jesus himself from Mark 13, 32. Commenting on the timing of the end and saying, but of that day and that hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Any time we attempt to remove these boundaries or extend them forward or add to what God has made known, we trespass on divine property and thus also assume God-like status. This is the core of the issue. This is what I would like you to remember. God created man in his own image and we return the favor in so many ways. A.W. Tozer once said, 
that if we try to search the unsearchable by our flawed wisdom, then we inevitably contrive an idol. And Karl Barth, the Swiss theologian in On Religion, claimed that our attempt to anticipate God is to foist a human product in the place of God's revelation, God's word. The idolatry of knowledge is to want to know more. And to want to know more is to want to be more. It just so happens that the biblical account of the temptation narrative and the fall of the human race sheds considerable light on this issue, for it also identifies the problem in the idolatry of knowledge. Whether or not you accept Genesis 3 as history is of little concern for us now. But let us recall the basic contours of this story about the human dilemma as it centers on the choice between two trees in the midst of a primeval garden, the tree of life on the one hand and the tree of knowledge on the other, knowing good and evil. This tree, the tree of knowledge, is the tree of forbidden wisdom signifying the limits of human knowledge as the corollary of the limits of our godlike status because God has created the human being to be like God with limitations. Therefore also human knowledge must be limited. And as the story goes, as many of you know, <laughs> that tree of knowledge was Genesis 3, 5, desired to make one wise. <clears throat> For which reason it was ad advertised by the tempter as a tree that would make man like God, or shall I say, more <coughs> like God. In the same way Ezekiel 28, 17 identifies the human dilemma in this way. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your glory. The corruption of wisdom denotes the removal of boundaries set by God for the sake of the projection of a larger image of self. Am I on time? You can finish your thought, but we're about out of time. So whether we talk about Montanos or William Miller or Harold Camping, the next time you think about the vain attempts to predict the timing of the end, think of these attempts as naked, idolatrous acts. <coughs> naked acts of idolatry. The idolatry of human knowledge. And the antidote to idolatry, any kind of idolatry, is revelation. God's unveiling of himself and of his plan for the world, including the plan for the future. But again, we must accept the limits that God has set for us. We cannot know the timing of the end, except that it will come. It will come. What we do know and what God wants us all to believe here tonight and every day of our lives is that the end is wrapped up and linked forever with one person, Jesus Christ, who is the Alpha and the Omega, who is the beginning and the end. And how you relate to this person determines how this end will be for you. Thank you. Good evening. Our, our four speakers and their uh, preliminary speeches. Uh, we're going to move to panelist conversation. So we're going to have a conversation between all four of our panelists. Um, we're going to take a few minutes to outfit them all with microphones. Um, 
And basically how this is going to work is we have 20 minutes total. I will allow the conversation to flow relatively freely between the panelists. Um, but we do need some ground rules. So starting with Dr. Fergan, I'll ask each speaker um, to give one question in order. Um, and once they ask a question, the other speakers can respond and, uh, and conversate. Um, but please be respectful of the fact that we only have 20 minutes total, and I'd like to hear all the speakers talking. So uh, basically, don't hog time. Um, so yes, be respectful of the other speakers um, and their time constraints. I'm going to get Mike set up before we start with the questions. So hang on one moment, please. In a couple of minutes, right, that's into the future. Will this bridge hold up when we're done building it? Things like this. These are predictions and depend upon our knowledge of the future gained through the natural and empirical natural sciences. I actually wanted to ask um, Martin Emmert a question about the kind of limitations that you articulated uh, that um, we ought to perhaps operate within the bounds of something like this. Yeah. Um, so, so two, two, I don't have a question directly, but I want to, want to get at it. Like maybe I'll articulate it as a question. You describe the tree of knowledge of, of good and evil as um, as out of bounds, more so famously, is, but first, this is a tree of knowledge of good and evil, and so it might make my chosen profession in ethics particularly problematic. But it doesn't seem to me that knowledge per se is thereby forbidden. And of course, I don't have the kind of bibliotic expertise, but I'd like you to address that first. Right, and, and I would love to. The, the the tree of knowing good and evil is the tree of forbidden wisdom or forbidden knowledge beyond the boundaries established by God, because at the time in the narrative. The human creature does not know the difference between good and evil, is naive, is, let us say, childish, in such a sense that um, the acquisition of this knowledge is something entirely novel and changes the course of his life and being and existence forever. So any knowledge which could change the course of one's life and existence or being forever falls into the forbidden camp. I mean, that's what I have difficulty understanding. No. What I'm worried about is drawing a boundary between acceptable knowledge and unacceptable knowledge, or forbidden knowledge. Where's that boundary? The boundary is, as I see it, set by knowing the unknowable. You can speculate but about uh, the existence of things that uh, do not appear. You can speak of, as we said, for example, the scenario of the end of the world, you can speculate about these things, but any time you do this, you push the boundaries of what God has revealed about these things, what can be known. And, and that is, um, that's, that's knowledge that um, operates outside of the boundaries of, of, of this, of, of revealed knowledge. Uh would either of the other two and, speakers like to weigh in on this question? And as I said, I, I, I wish to make that very clear. Um, any scientific investigation, uh, any philosophical investigation, is um, a very valid um, undertaking. There is there's nothing wrong about uh, asking questions about the planet or the world in which we live. In fact, we ought to. We ought to be very concerned about the planet <laughs> on which we live because we have a responsibility to keep it, to um, to care for it, and we haven't done a particularly good job at it. All right, we're about halfway through our time, just as a as a benchmark for you guys. And I would, Dr. Ferner and Dr. von Germerton, like to weigh in on that question, or Dr. Ferner could ask the question as well. Still haven't used your question. Well, Nicole was thinking about the question, formulating it. I I do think that not every age is apocalyptic. If you look at uh, European history, there are quiet times, times when people were relatively satisfied, when government uh, seemed uh, to take care of things. There were no major wars, no famines and the like. I think at the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st, we're living through a time of angst. A lot of people are very worried about many things. They're worried about the economy. They're worried about the state of uh, global warming. They're world worried about whether there are going to be jobs available for the next generation. It encompasses almost everything. And it seems to me that we, with maybe a kind of short-sightedness that historians claim not to have, uh, we, we don't see things very clearly and we think our problems are greater than they've ever been before. And as a historian, I can't say that. 
I can't say that our problems are greater than we've ever had before in any area, but I think there's a, a widespread belief that things are so bad in so many areas that it must indicate something bad is going to happen. And it does. Because that's what I'm doing. Anybody else want to respond? Sure, I'll, I'll, I have a response. Um, yeah, I thought it was a really uh, interesting transition from Dr. Thompson's to your presentation because um, just to pay, play the devil's advocate, so to speak. <laughs> I wonder <laughs> if, you know, if they do, I mean, this could be the interpretation, and I'm, I'm um, you know, I, I've studied uh, Catholicism for my short career, right? right. And so I, I take religion extremely seriously in terms of respecting um, people's beliefs. Um, I don't think you can should study it in any other way. I just. I think it is possible to interpret uh, your presentation as saying it's possibly there. People might interpret it as saying there should be some limit. Uh, we can, uh, we should concern ourselves less about the dire predictions that you. And there's a, a suggestion that that perhaps that um, then I, I would I don't want to argue for you, but there could be an idea that well then we don't need to change our behavior in terms of. CO2 consumption and what have you, as drastically as we might, because we no. should, we can't know. So that that's just a, a possible interpretation. Right. And thank you for that uh, clarification. I can see the danger of being understood this way, and yet it would be a misinterpretation of what I was saying. What I did say was geared, and geared only with regards to uh, Christian predictions about the end of the world. And I made it clear at the beginning that that is my contribution. I don't intend to uh, you know, encroach upon your territory as a philosopher on the theologian. And uh, I speak theologically. I, I offer a theological um, uh, account on the subject. And that is all. And I do firmly believe that uh, we are in big trouble. Um, ecologically speaking, and we have uh, very, very little time before we um, eat our own food, <coughs> as the Germans say. <laughs> <laughs> I was born and raised in Germany. In the mid-80s, we lived in a world where the Iron Curtain was very much intact, where atomic war was always looming. And um, the sky didn't look quite so blue to us in those days. In 1985, the U.S. American government offered, um, uh, published a study called Global 2000 that was the first um, grand-scale ecological study about an end of the world scenario similar to what uh, Alan um, uh, developed here. And we read and studied and poured over it and we went like, mm. um, because we could see that um, if nothing is being done about these things, we will and our children will suffer <coughs> for our sins. I can report that there has been a, a, a real groundswell of um, religious environmentalism, not only in Christianity, but across the world's great religions, uh, famously reinterpreting the charge of uh, uh, that, that what, what is it famous? Uh, the stewardship sort of interpretation, whether it's just license to do what you will, or whether it's a kind of responsibility to bear uh, for God's creation, uh, understood in that sort of framework. Uh, but Martin, I'd like to ask you, do you think uh, that in your experience it would be a fair interpretation to um, categorize the religious fervor around the apocalypse, and these are things not turned towards the religious environmentalism that I was just suggesting, is an overemphasis on salvation as opposed to creation, and that maybe... Yeah, and, and uh, you know, um, apocalyptic as a genre um, came into being or came into its own when religious people heard the, the invective of the prophet that would say, how long, O oh Lord, how long? And uh, the apocalyptist then gave the answer by setting the day and the hour. And um, 
the, 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 the situation, the historical situation in which uh, apocalyptic can exist is to a great deal one that involves a, a people, a religious people, standing with a back against the wall, wondering where all of this and when all of this will end. A marginalized people that long for deliverance. Would uh, Dr. Ferner, do you have a question to ask? No, but I think maybe we should get, I think there's some people in the audience that might. So maybe well, we, we, have an, we have another couple minutes. Are there any closing remarks on the conversation before we move into question and answer? We are a little bit short on time, probably because of our sound. Um, everybody good? All right, a quick round of applause for all of our people. real quick is we're going to start question and answer. Uh, stay seated right now, but what we're going to do is have a row in each aisle. So when I give the word, you'll come up and line up, um, being respectful of people around you. Um, we're going to have one mic with Justin Mark here, one of our Socratic Club members. Um, he's going to go from line to line and alternating the two lines. So he will allow you to ask your question and then move to the other line. Uh, once you ask your question, uh, you can listen to the answer and then go back to your seat, but we're not going to allow uh, you to rebuttal or rebut or give a second question or anything like that. We just don't have the time for it tonight. We want to reach a lot of people. Um, we have 45 minutes, but it goes really fast. Um, let's see. So please have your question ready as soon as you get in line. When it's your turn, please begin by designating which speaker or speakers you're addressing your question to, and I'll let them address it first. And then we will allow speakers to comment that were not directly asked the question. Um, but speakers, please keep your comments to one, maybe two minutes here, especially if you weren't asked the question specifically. Um, please refrain, refrain from statements of personal opinion or arguing with any of the speakers, obviously, or delivering a speech, quoting anybody at length. Um, please return to your seat afterwards. And um, yeah, go ahead and form two lines. One in each aisle, and Justin will give you the mic when I start questions. Um, so we're going to have one mic per table, and one for Justin. Do we have three mics? Yes. It looks like you do. So, and they're all working okay? Sure this one. Sure that one. And then I need to have many attempts, right? Which one are you not? Which other question are you um, if you'd like, but we only have one mic. Well, that's our sense. You're fine, too. Yeah. Thank you. Well, it was perfectly fine. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna begin the questions. This is a question for the philosopher. I'm wondering, you use the term historic norm, and I want to know what is the definition of a historic norm? Oh, is that, is that clear? <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. It's a good question. Um, uh, the, the Holocene era, the geologic epoch, I, I don't know, I'm not a geologist, but, but, and I know it's an era, right, that in which all of human civilization uh, has come into existence, about 10,000, 12,000, 10,000 years, something like that, out of the last ice age. If, if you were to look at a graph, um, it comes up, the temperature up out of the last ice age, and then varies very little um, off of, a, off of a nor an average for 10,000, say, years until we hit the industrial period and it starts going up again. And so this sets a baseline, what I suggest was the pre-industrial historic uh, norm, which is the global mean temperature. Uh, and uh, the scientists in here can help me out with this. And so it turns out that um, the, the mean temperature is rising off of that norm. It, it's a statistic. Okay. Any other comments before we move on to the next question? I think that one was mostly for Dr. Thompson. My question for Alan, I was wondering if the IPC climate models, any of them take into account the changing rate of the oceanic conveyor? Um, uh, I think they make predictions. You're talking about the thermohaline 
right in the in the in the Atlantic region. The saline under the water. Yeah, the, but that drives the Gulf Stream and all this, right? Um, I don't know about. Um, I don't know if it's slowing. I don't. I, I don't believe that it's slowing. And there were some predictions to bring up Al Gore again, and there were predictions early on uh, about it coming to a stop. The possibility of it's coming to a stop if all of it. Uh, the Greenland ice sheet were to melt and drop all this cold water in, that would create such a disruption that it stopped doing it, and then the lit, then Europe would be cast again into a kind of ice age, despite the mean average global temperature going up. So climate change, global warming and climate change are, are distinct, right? Glo global warming is talking about the mean, the average mean global temperature, and that causes climate change around the world, which is various and unpredictable in lots of ways at a, a variety of locations, could include all sorts of cooling in a, in a variety of locations. Um, I, I did have some note about that. If you give me just one more second to try to find that. Um, there's the Greenland ice sheet. Um, it turns out that, um, uh, that there are some models suggesting a sustained warming at the IPCC best estimates for the end of the century uh, would initiate an irreversible melting of the Greenland ice sheet, which could ultimately contribute 23 feet to sea level rise. But this doesn't uh, also account for its effect on the, um, the, the, the oceanic circulation there, as you ask the question. I hope that helps. Okay. Any other comments on that question before we move on? <laughs> <laughs> I guess, I guess. Well, I mean, can I say one thing? Remember, I'm not a climate scientist. Right. I'm a philosopher. <laughs> I do ethics. Maybe we should have a climate scientist. <laughs> <laughs> Doing my best. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Well, my question is directed to the same gentleman. Um, I understand that Al Gore is the guy that brought up first um, carbon credits. My question is, who owns the past book for that savings account of carbon credits? If you're wealthy or if you're a politician, you can ride in an airplane, you know, or, or limousine and use up your carbon credits and not have to pay uh, or you're not, you're not fussed at as much as say we, Jill and Joe Normal, are fussed at for using our regular parts. Well, thank you for the question. Uh, I think there's a lot going on uh, in in your question. The worry at the end was about um, our individual carbon footprint, as it's sometimes des described, um, and buying offsets. There is a um, there are fledgling endeavors to um, establish carbon, a market and carbon offsets for individuals to buy. This is a, a, temp, a currently unregulated market, and there's, um, there's worries about double counting these carbon credits and everything like this. Uh, there's, there's grave concerns ab about that, um, likening it to uh, the selling of indulgences by the church in the Middle Ages, right? <laughs> Buying off your sins some, by some other place. So there's a lot of uh, ethical, thanks for the ethical. There's a lot of uh, ethically dubious uh, issues associated with the carbon footprint and, and buying offsets, this sort of thing. Um, people like Al Gore do buy plenty of offsets. He's got plenty of money to buy plenty of offsets. He can also make arguments that he's doing, he's in a position to do a lot of good given that he flies around, and I work with a lot of people who fly to conferences all the time to talk about this sort of stuff, and they've got a big carbon footprint on account of it. These are very difficult calculations then to, to make as we each have to assess individually, can we justify our uh, expenditure of carbon, uh, our carbon footprint, right? The, and the consequences it will do to future generations of human beings for uh, the conveniences or the good that we think we're doing with it, whether it's just this convenience for ourselves or good for society. Um, I okay, thought... Can we move on to the next question? Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> we can always come back to it if we have a lot of time. Enjoy all three of you speaking. Your comments, Dr. Thompson, made sense, are scary. What can I do as a retired school teacher, mill worker, living in Little Fulhamath, Oregon, besides pray a lot, which I do. Yeah. Um, there, there, there is advice, I think rather um, disappointing kind of advice, at something like the end of an inconvenient truth or other uh, 
films or media that popularize the climate crisis say, what can I do? And it's things like change all your uh, light bulbs to this, you know, compact fluorescence, fill up, make sure your tires are properly inflated, things like this. And I, and I won't say that those won't help at all, but um, there's a huge collective action problem going on here. And there's nothing any one of us can do to cause or prevent the phenomena that's unfolding, the global climate cha change and crisis that's unfolding. There's not, no one's lifestyle can do anything. There are concerns about maybe setting examples for others, but in, a, in effect, causally, you cannot do very much at all alone. So really, I would suggest join an organization, uh, become informed about how these issue, issues uh, transect with issues on the ballots and various leaders who might come into elected office who can pull levers of power and uh, utilize your citizen, uh, your, your power as a voting member of our democracy. Any other comments on that question? <laughs> uh, my question for Professor Hamilton. Um, you, it's a little off topic, but my question was, you raised twice that it didn't do the indigenous people any good to speculate on the Mayan calendar. Have you, in your living, um, witnessed the Mayan people being the, at the butt of jokes or special treatment because of the Mayan calendar? No, I don't uh, argue that. I just think that um, there's a certain, um, I, I guess it's, you're, you're right to point out I'm expressing an opinion that's uh, debatable. Um, I guess I feel that um, there's a certain, I, I just don't really see that um, uh, having a belief in something that really has nothing to do with the Mayas is in any way showing sympathy for them. I feel that if you want to show sympathy for them, perhaps there's other ways of doing it as what you've suggested, do it on the voting ballot, what have you. Because actually, um, uh, a lot of the people who are uh, working across the U.S. from Mexico are, are Mayas. It's very clear to see particular ethnicities, and a lot of those people are Mayas. So if, you, if you truly feel some sort of um, unity in any spiritual way with those people, there's certainly better ways to do it than to think about the end of time, which as, as a Hope I proved has nothing to do with their particular worldview. I hope that's a satisfactory answer. My question is for you, Mr. Emmerich. So um, you are a theologian, and so all of your your comments are based on the Bible. And so many times throughout the Bible, we've seen lots of examples of prophecy or um, foretelling of the future. You know, like it never dictates the process, but it definitely dictates the outcome. And so how do you leave room for the gift of prophecy or for telling the future between like forbidden knowledge and like divine revelation? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I believe that since the completion of the canon, there can be no major prophecy that would change the, um, the scenario of, of end times as they are laid out in scripture. And in short, that is my answer don't believe that uh, someone could come along, uh, whether his name is Camping or Miller or whoever, um, and uh, claim to be a prophet and predict or um, um, develop a scenario that changes um, or could possibly change the biblical scenario of eschatology. Eschatology conceived in broad terms, including the first and the second coming of Christ the return of Jesus Christ. Anything else on that before I move on? All right. uh, uh, Dr. Franklin developed the concept that modern uh, predictors of specific dates for the apocalypse were uh, part, partly self-aggrandizing, that they were trying to say, I'm important because I know I have this special knowledge. and. Uh, is there any reason to say that the original authors of Daniel or, or the Apocalypse, uh, or the, the Revelation of St. John, had any other reason for predicting the Apocalypse than the, that they thought this would give weight to their own, the, the message that they were sending by including this concept of the Apocalypse? They were saying, I have a special knowledge and therefore I'm important and you should listen to me. Well, let me... Let me just 
just go back to say I don't think that all people who uh, attempt to uh, portend the future are doing it for their own purposes. Um, maybe, maybe not, but it's not just ignorant people who portend the future. Some very famous people in history. Um, I can give you a long list, uh, including Paracelsus, the very famous Renaissance physician, um, thought that they could in some way foretell the future. Um, I think it's a mistake, but some of them probably did it for the best of reasons. And in the case of, say, Daniel or the, you know, the writer of Revelation, the Apostle John, um, they believed that they were receiving revelation from God. Uh, and in both cases, they, they um, believed that they were receiving visions. And as a Christian, I think they were. So I give a credibility to John's visions in Revelation and Daniel's in the Old Testament that I simply don't give to a modern visionary. must be made to ask to ask the question is not sinful um, and if that question should pop up into your mind uh, don't worry about it but uh, when you claim to know that is when you have crossed the line because then you become uh, a person that knows more than you possibly could uh, this is a pretty generic kind of question for uh, Dr. Gary from here um, what were some other cases, perhaps, of, of predictions about end times? Even in antiquity, the Greeks are perhaps there's some, some some cults within you know, the Egyptians, as well as throughout other cases and time periods. Other missionaries where people were thinking about or predicting that there would be a time where the world will actually. Do you want a lecture? Sure. <laughs> sure. Uh, there were there were differences in the perception of time in the ancient world. The classical cultures believed in a cyclical universe. Uh, and I think ancient Near Eastern peoples, many of them did as well. But there would be a great con can you hear? Oh, try that one real quick. Um, <laughs> the Greeks and the Romans believed in a, a cycle of time. Um, and uh, every whatever it was, 26,000 years or something like that, there would be a great conflagration, uh, the world would be destroyed, and then everything would happen again. So if you believed in that view, uh, sometime 26 or 27,000 years from now, we will be sitting in this room, and you'll be looking at your watches and wondering why we're saying so much when you just want to get home. Uh, that was one view. Uh, I think the idea of linear time comes from uh, Jewish Christian ideas. There's a beginning with creation, there will be an end of the world. That's a linear view, and that hasn't been held by all people. So um, within that framework, there, there are and always will be people who want to look through their periscope and see around the corner. And uh, I think, uh, so there will always be people. Montanus in the second century, uh, several medieval mystics, Heracalsus, William Miller, and there will be others during your lifetime. And uh, I think that's the kind of knowledge that Dr. Emmerich was talking about. It's forbidden. We're not given to know the future for very good reasons. So if you want to know the future, go to a tea leaf reader. Um, they might give you the, the best advice. Any other comments on that before we move on? Dr. I'd just like to make a quick comment that um, I agree completely with what you say about uh, teleological civilizations versus more cyclical. And I think the one that I was discussing was is actually a more cyclical. So to impose a teleological um, model on it is really out of the realm of that particular culture. Any question? I had a question for the theologian. If we, uh, and I believe you accepted the fact that uh, the science and we must be stewards of our environment and the, uh, the discussion is that our best case scenario is about 200, maybe 300 years before we have environmental disaster. Doesn't that put a restriction on what our interpretation of 
when Jesus would come? Um, do we have a time frame before that? Before we end up in an environmental disaster or barbarians again, will Jesus come before then? I don't know. <laughs> Well, all I can say is that a, a, a biblical view of creation would include precisely the things that Alan is talking about, that um, we have a call to take good care of this world and to do everything we can. And if we haven't done a good job at doing this, then uh, we must change and we must change very quickly. I'd like to say one thing to that. That's fine. Thanks. Um, just to ju ju um, just to be clear, I was not saying. I mean, I think it's a bit of a m misunderstanding head of the position I was trying to articulate to say that we've got two or three hundred years until there is some environmental disaster. I tried to start off by saying there's environmental disasters unfolding today on account of anthropogenic forcings of the climactic system. We don't face them here, and it turns out with, with some great injustices that the rich developed countries will be the last to face them. Um, not only because we have the resources to adapt in all sorts of ways and protect ourselves, uh, but also because of, of our geolocation, it turns out, and the, the, um, the food belts will move further north into Canada, things like this. But it's not that in two or three hundred years suddenly we're going to fall off a cliff. It's, it's happening today, and it's going to increasingly happen, and we've got to be worried about uh, unknown tipping points out there where it will leave our control to set emission standards by international agreement to bring down the anthropogenic forcings because it will have positive feedbacks of a variety of kind that accelerate the warming all by itself. Okay? And these are worries we have today, not two or three hundred years from now. It's interesting that we're talking about a different apocalyptic scenario. Those of you, and there are quite a few in this audience who are my generation and grew up in the 1950s, remember when an atomic attack and the destruction of all human civilization was much talked about. And that was the, that was the death knell of, of the world. And when I was in third grade, we actually went down the basement of our old brick school and hid under desk, desks in case there should be an atomic attack on the United States. As a Christian, I believe in original sin, and I believe that man has lots of ways of doing much evil to the world. We can do a great deal of evil to the world, and we can make a mess of the world uh, for ourselves and our grandchildren. But one thing that I don't believe God has placed within our, within our hands is the ability to destroy ourselves or all human life. And there's where I disagree with some of my secular colleagues who think we may actually destroy ourselves, uh, destroy all mankind. And uh, I just don't believe that God has given us that power. There are limits even to the evil that mankind can do. Can I, can I address that? Or we take a question? Uh, very quickly. Sorry, we won't move on to the next question. Sorry, did you want to say something? <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say I, I'm, I'm puzzled by that. Uh, I, there is a lot of um, similarities between the anxiety caused by the threat of nuclear apocalypse during the Cold War and the threat of global climate change today. But to say that um, a God, uh, our Creator, would not, could not, uh, has not given us the power to destroy ourselves is another one of these sort of slippery slope problems. People destroy other people all the time. We do it all the time, and you wonder where the limit would be uh, causally to stop that going up, and I don't see why the nuclear bombs all going off would conceivably bring about the end of all of humanity, we're just one species on the planet, so I don't understand the, the, the point at which we see our ability to cause destruction to one another suddenly capped off in principle at the destruction of all of humanity. I don't understand that. Okay. I'll, I'll just give you a short answer. <laughs> <laughs> the short answer is that why I don't believe in apocalyptic ideas at all. I think scripture makes it very clear that God has a plan for the human race. And it involves the redemption of the human race. And it involves the creation of a new heaven and a new earth. So now there would be Christian revelation which my secular colleagues would accept. But that's the reason. We can do a great deal wrong. 
to ourselves and our planet. But I don't think, if from a Christian assumption, set of assumptions, we can't destroy ourselves. You know, that's, okay. that's the limit. Okay. All right, next question. Well, my original comment, or question rather, was in regards to the, there being some sort of point of no return, which you both seem to have addressed quite concisely just there. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll go on to another question in the sense that if it's the Christian prerogative, prerogative to um, say not be too concerned with these issues, um, what would you do about that? Is this a question clear? I don't think that Christians ought not to be concerned about these things. I don't even believe that they should not be too concerned about them. I think they should be very concerned about them. If, uh, you have a family and uh, your lifestyle is um, making a royal mess of, of both you and the people around you, you have reason to be concerned about it. And so also at a national level, um, we have reason to be concerned. And on a global level, we have reason to be concerned about uh, where this planet is going. However, there is a meta-narrative to all of this, to this planet and the history that unfolds on this stage that is the planet. And that is that God will not allow the total destruction of this world because the world must continue until God's plan is fulfilled. That is what I believe and that is what the Bible does teach. Any other comments on that question? Well, I just wish to uh, add in regards to Alan's comment earlier, um, the doomsday scenario, the possibility that we could possibly um, destroy the human race, destroy ourselves, is um, as apocalyptic as anything, to be sure, but it is also very speculative because so far we have only seen the destruction of human beings, nations included, um, in, a, in a local sense, not in a global sense. And um, so um, it takes a good deal of speculation to arrive at that conclusion. Uh, so, like many, um, I'm concerned about my fossil fuel use, and it's extremely difficult to participate in society without using it. Yeah. Well, so recently, I went to an AA group, and I confessed my addiction, my helplessness in the face of this addiction. Um, and so then, listening to you all tonight, I'm seeing, is there also um, an addiction to apocalypticism? And then I also thought of what Mark said about the opiate of the masses. So whatever comments you have. <laughs> um, addicts, when they admit their alcoholism, do stop drinking first. So, so I'll say, just because you you. You, you see that you have a fossil fuel consumption problem. <laughs> and admitting it is a first step. It <laughs> doesn't let you off the hook from trying to reduce it. Right? You have to stop your drink. Stop your consuming, your, your, your fossil fuel consuming. Or, bring, or always work regularly to, to bring it down. Regarding the, the addiction of, of apocalypticism or something, or to apocalyptic visions, um, I only wish that I uh, wasn't confronted with one all the time. I mean, the sort of work that I do is to stick my nose in this information all the time, the scientific data, and my job really is to, is to work on a kind of hypothesis. If, if what the best of our climate scientists tell us is true, then what should we do? Then morally, what should we do? Right? And my job is to try to address the what should we do part. Um, and I wish the whole problem would go away. I wish it were just something that if I could make the apocalypse disappear by saying, I see it's some sort of psychological problem with me. I'm addicted to visions of the apocalypse, and I just need to quit forming them. I would pay good money for a session like that, that sort of climate change, to, you know, anonymous. But uh, it, it confronts me again and again and again, and I don't think it's going away. I don't think it's really account, uh, can be accounted for by a kind of... Uh, tick or self-absorption or self-satisfaction with these ideas as we hear connected with some of the traditions only partial. I bet you need to say this in some context. It's turned off. <laughs>
This is a good time to say something in answer to your question. I think concerns with saving our planet are important. But I don't think they're the ultimate problems that we face. We look at a society that doesn't leave a lot of people very happy um, in the economy, in a whole variety of ways. There's an extensive dissatisfaction. What is its cause? I think its root cause is what I would call the original sin of mankind. Our inability to live with ourselves and to live with each other. Um, you can talk about almost as any aspect of, of, of social life and society, about education, about the crime rate, uh, about the breakdown of, of marriage and the household, and there are problems. Uh, without being simplistic, I think that there are many problems we face and the chief problem is to get human beings to stop treating other human beings as if they really didn't matter. As if I'm the center of the world and I'm the only person that, 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 um, that matters. And I think, I think that comes, and the Christian prescription for that is through repentance for our sin uh, and a desire to live for other people. Where do you start? Well, you start with yourself, you start with your family, you start with people around you, and you create a light that sends a glow uh, to those within your, your orbit. I know that sounds very simple, it sounds like something you learn in Sunday school, but I do think that's a more ultimate problem than even the problem of, of saving our planet. And that, by the way, would be helped too. But as a Christian, Gary, wouldn't you agree that the most important thing is not necessarily how we treat each other, but how we treat God? Precisely. How we think of God. Precisely. And yeah. then secondarily, how we translate this into the lives with one another. Sure. The community. Sure. It's a vertical relationship with God. It's a horizontal, horizontal relationship with other people. And I don't think you can have one without the other. And that brings religion into it, and one is not supposed to do that. Secondary. <laughs> All right, this is a question for Alan. Um, first, I'd like to say that I do realize you're a philosopher and not a scientist. That being said, this is a question kind of along the normal topic you guys are having. Um, I'd like to ask um, you can't talk about how either we're, we're, we're going in that direction, and the only thing we do is slow it down. Are we ultimately doomed to? complete environmental destruction? And if we can do something about it, what do you, not just the science, but do you believe yourself needs to actually be done as a society? Not just individuals. Um, I, I, I don't think it's fated that it's going to happen. In fact, I can share with my colleagues here that uh, it's, it's, it's not um, uh, it's not necessarily the case that human beings are going to bring about the end of their own species, right, through climate change or something else, let alone the end of their species, the, the kind of destruction of global biodiversity and the richness of life that we see evident on the, on the planet now. Um, we can slow it down. Uh, we uh, can do a lot of mitigation still. I think that um, Bill McKibben's group, uh, 350.org, has just made some progress by sitting in with the Occupy Wall Street people uh, just in the last couple of days, and there, we see forces growing there. Um, we're over 350 now. Uh, we, they, um, parts per million, they have charts for bringing it down to keep the, raise in, the rise in mean global temperatures at or below a two uh, degree Celsius increase over this norm. There are trajectories that we could still achieve. Uh, it's possible. However, the political realist in me uh, thinks it's becoming more and more improbable, more and more improbable, less and less likely that we will uh, prevent uh, more and more catastrophic change. So while this is not an excuse to give up our efforts at mitigating our greenhouse gas emissions, because that's driving the problem, that's the fundamental driver, there, there are a number of others, but that's the fundamental one, um, we have to start thinking more about adaptation. And this is actually what I was going to say in my, in my two minutes, so maybe I'll, I'll say some of that. But I think that um, what we need to do is put pressures on uh, uh, regional, where we're having some success, national, and the international 
uh, policy level to get binding emission limitations as soon as possible. Anybody else? Uh, I'm going to hold the questions to, <coughs> excuse me, these last two people, uh, and then we'll be at 9 o'clock for closing statements. So. Okay, so some people, I mean, it appears like it might be necessary to have a very powerful government to, uh, to put some kind of limit on environmental abuses and that kind of thing. Is it going to run into some kind of problem where there's an inherent threat that you could empower a government so much that it could become a threat itself? Like, in order to stop atmospheric pollution, which doesn't respect political boundaries, you have to have some kind of global government. And in so doing, you would do empower a potential tyrant someday. Uh, some people have um, positively imagined that um, to solve environmental crisis, we have to bring a close to a demo democratic procedures for a while. There are worries, legitimately so, of, uh, of this as a kind of eco-fascism. I, I don't uh, buy your premise that in order to uh, prevent ongoing uh, 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 greenhouse gas emissions, we have to have one government. We have all sorts of treaties, international treaties, and we've fixed other environmental problems which have different parameters and different issues, like the hole in the ozone and the emission of uh, chlorofluorocarbons and other pollutants causing that. It turns out we had uh, alternative chemicals that were not as damaging. We could easily replace them, and so we have international treaties uh, to, to, uh, that brought that under control. There are precedents for doing it without one world government. I completely agree with you that there's um, there is concern for a monopoly of power in, in sort of a one world government. Uh, I think those issues are independent of, and are, that government is not necessary to achieve the kind of international policy agreement that we have. Any other comments? This will be our last question. My question is uh, directed to Dr. Ferguson and Dr. Emmerich. Um, throughout the Bible, we see a lot of times where a prophecy would come against a particular people.